So um, we'll start with the first module of lecture one. What is a brain-computer interface? Um, there is a definition that has been given already um, 20 years or 30 years ago in, 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 the, in the 70s, and which has evolved to this one here, uh, which reads, the goal of BCI technology is to give severely paralyzed people another way to communicate, a way that does not depend on muscle control. And so that um, sp talks specifically about clinical populations, people who are paralyzed, who cannot move. And in, for these people, BCI allows them to communicate with the outside world and, and drive wheelchairs and things like that. And that used to be the working definition for the last 10 years or something like that. And has driven basically the whole field and given rise to most of the technology that we have today. It has only recently uh, uh, been that we ventured into new fields in applying that technology also to healthy populations. And because this was about tetraplegics and so on, it was pr specifically about avoiding any muscular inputs uh, in, in the way in which these things work. Because uh, you know, locked-in people, for example, can by definition not use these kinds of um, modalities. So uh, here's a, a little picture of what such a BCI used to look like. So you have a person here called patient who has some sensors attached to his head, uh, plugged into some box. And it needs to go into some sort of amplifier because it's very small voltages and AD converter uh, and goes into a computer where it's being processed. And we are mostly talk about that part here in, in this overall lecture and the mathematics of that. And then at some point you need to close the loop so that the person can actually control something or sees what he's spelling and so on. That's what this laptop here is doing. Um, and now we have extended this definition to some extent um, to include everything that we can tackle with the technology that we have. So we say um, a BCI is a system which takes a biosignal measured from a person and predicts in real time or on a single trial basis some abstract aspect of the person's cognitive state. So um, that is a rather general definition. And it basically allows you to build uh, to call any system which among others takes brain signals and so on and predicts cognitive state you know, in quotes, um, call that a BCI. So biosignals in, here comes a BCI, and here's a state prediction. And we'll, we'll break this also down and talk about what kinds of signals you can work with and what kinds of state you can estimate. But first, um, we'll, we'll go through a few more detailed definitions. We defined these in 2009. Um, and you can split up BCIs into three categories, if you will. One is the so-called active BCI. And uh, what an active BCI is, is one that you control by conscious voluntary thought. You are focusing on a control thought, such as imagining to move your limbs or things like that. And you directly try to manipulate something with that, such as an application or so. The reactive BCI is fundamentally different, because what you do here is you're in you still control something, and you still focus on it consciously in some sense, but, and you still have voluntary action. But you utilize um, brain processes that happen in response to external events. So say you focus on a flickering light, and the brain-computer interface analyzes your brain responses to this input. So you're always dependent on this thing happening in your environment. But because these, these things are very robust, they tend to work pretty well if the circumstances allow for that. And the third um, class of BCIs is fundamentally different. It's a difference in purpose. The idea of a passive BCI is that you're not trying to control anything. You're not focusing on anything and not thinking about control thoughts or so. Instead, the passive BCI essentially picks up any brain processes that, that your brain generates anyway while you're doing something, say you're driving or relaxing or so things that you don't have to focus on, you don't have to spend your resources on, and uh, utilizes that info to add to your life, to add to your um, interaction that you have with your computer and things like that. And so it doesn't cost you, and that's why you can have many passive PCIs running in parallel, picking up, say, your workload, your excitement level, if there's such a thing, uh, your attention distribution or stuff like that. Um, 
which is something that you cannot do with, with these other kinds of PCIs. You cannot, at the same time, control you know, five different things or so. So um, these are three subtimes. And we'll now um, talk about uh, <laughs> one big thing uh, in the future. And, and that's, of course, um, the software and the algorithms and what kinds of things they can handle and what kinds of outputs they um, tend to produce when, when fed with brain signals. Um, by the way, this is a rather antiquated uh, picture. And here's a more modern BCI setup. So uh, these are some folks from our lab, our co-director. Nowadays, f when you're talking about applications for healthy people, you want to use wireless headsets. You want to use electrodes that, that are as easy to apply as putting up a, a bike helmet or so. And in fact, this is a bike helmet. Um, you use wireless handsets and so on, like this tablet here, to actually interact with that instead of, of these 1990s era um, computers, of course. But the basic principles and the mathematics are, of course, still exactly the same. So um, talking about the inputs, the biosignals, um, most importantly, you'll want to deal with brain signals, of course. And uh, the key modality is for us the EEG. The reason is that it's it's relatively cheap to measure. All you need is a couple of electrodes on the head, pretty much, um, it, which is what's used here in both cases. Um, the difference is just in whether you need conductive gel, like here, or whether it's so-called dry electrodes, which don't need this gel, which is you know something you have to wash out after you're done, and it's somewhat uncomfortable. But of course, it's not unhealthy or anything like that. And there's a competitive. <laughs> a competitor class of PCIs, you could say, which is functional near-infrared spectroscopy, or FNIRS. This uses a non-electrical brain process. It uses, essentially, differences in blood oxygen level in the brain as you recruit certain kinds of tissue in your brain to do certain kinds of things. Uh, and it works by shining light in there, infrared light, through some waveguide, and then measuring um, some kind of a response with a photosensor that is you know, one of these other wires. And from that, we deduce how and what you did in your, you know, in your mind. But these things are rather low resolution, both in space uh, and in time. So it's slow changing signals, right? Blood oxygen level and so on. So that's why we're usually not really talking about this. By the way, there's also much smaller form factor things than this. I've recently seen an FNIR system, which is basically a headband with an LED and a photosensor. Uh, there's a whole class of other things that you can use. Um, there's invasive sensors. Um, these are usually not used by healthy um, uh, people, because obviously these things are not yet biologically sustainable. We don't know. and um, you know, how long you can live with that, et cetera. It's being used for clinical populations who undergo, say, epilepsy surgeries and so on, and who have these things in there anyway. So these people can do BCI experiments to see how far we can push it. Um, or they use it with monkeys and rats and so on, but not humans currently. Of course, this will change at some point in the future. And there is another class of sensors at the other end of the spectrum, and that's sensors that basically fill an entire room, such as MEG, which requires a room full of shielding. Uh, <laughs> this isn't the biggest part of the, of the system here. And that measures a very similar field to the EEG, so magnetic field as opposed to the electrical field. Um, and you have fMRI, which many people know from, from the clinic, um, which measures at extreme spatial resolution blood flow changes. You can use, people have built BCIs for these kinds of scanners just for toy purposes, you know, have two patients at two ends of the um, hospital play pong against each other or things like that. But of course, this is absolutely not practical today for anything, any real world application. Um, so that takes us to the non-brain signals. Of course, you can use more than just brain signals. And perhaps you should, because um, in many cases, these extra signals give you information about the context that what you see in the brain happens in. So you know what the person is looking at through an eye tracker, like this one here from SMI. Uh, by the way, combined with the dry EEG headset here. Um, we have, you can use a motion capture from the Kinect, for example, to know the posture of the person, which tells you things, such as something about the emotional state of the person. 
or it tells you about what kinds of artifacts um, and, and noise signals project into the head just from that. So all of that is, is useful to improve the accuracy of your brain-computer interface if you can get it. It goes on with other electrical sensors such as EMG, which is a way to measure muscle tension. And there's some pretty cool applications uh, beyond that. There's armbands like this, which you can use to control things like a helicopter or something like that. So pretty cool gadgetry, you can say. If you put electrodes like this uh, next to the eyes, you can, to some extent, uh, do eye tracking. Uh, although it's, it has problems like drift and so on, but still you do get some extra information. And then there is also so-called um, sensor, uh, sorry, system state or application state that the person is interacting with. So this is just vari variables in your program, basically. You know, was, did we just show a stimulus or what's the angle of the vehicle that you simulate and things like that, um, or of your actual vehicle. And these are important extra context bits of information that you should use if you have them, because otherwise you're going to do a worse job. And that also includes I environmental signals like the power line noise that you pick up that you can use to get rid of some artifacts and things like that. And on the other end of the spectrum are the outputs of the BCI. And that is a wide open field, because in principle, um, as I show you in the next definition, you can basically estimate with a BCI anything, any aspect of the brain as a physical system, if you will, that you can measure with sufficient accuracy so that it's that you can pull something out on a single try, on a single instance of a single observation, in a sense. So um, we are really not constraining this by definition. So the question is really just what kinds of brain processes are easy enough to measure, perhaps low-hanging fruit, that you can do something with them. And we separate three classes. The first one we call tonic state. So these are slow changing brain processes, such as your degree of relaxation or your stress level and things like that, uh, cognitive load. And all these things have been tackled in the literature. You can Google this up, uh, although usually not with perfect accuracy. And there's only certain classes of brain dynamics that actually um, support these kinds of things. There's what we call phasic state, which is fast changing, you know, uh, state, if you will, that's such as uh, things like your current attention deployment, which might switch rapidly, or the, Im the movement that you imagine at a given point, and things like that. And third, there's event-related state that you could call this phasic state as well. But the important bit here is these are cognitive processes that are, and that are uh, linked to a particular event, perhaps an external one, like you saw something, did it surprise you or not? Or uh, you press a button, did you make an error or not? Or did you notice a particular kind of event and so on? So these usually rely on the presence of an event. So in some way your BCI has, has to know that kind of event.